you know, sometimes you just have to hit record, especially on the Protectors podcast. Today, you know, I'm having an excellent guest on. I've been pinging him back and forth. We've been texting for, geez, I don't even know how long, just about anything and everything. But now we're actually going to sit down and talk about his books. And I love his books, man. Second book in about a year where I actually just sat down and read it. And that was Split Decisions. I love that book so much. It's It hits me personally. But then I, you know, I'm going through your record and I'm like, you got a ton of books. Douglas Century has a ton of books that need to be read. What is going on, brother? And welcome to the show. It, it'll take you a century to get through Century's books, man. Um, it's I'm doing well. I remember when you first hit me up about Split Decision and you said it really hit personally. You also wrote one of the most personal reviews on Amazon and maybe on Goodreads, and it was like about you and your brother, and you know, we don't have to rehash it, but I think this story is very universal for a lot of families or in a lot of friendships, meaning one guy took one path and one guy took another, and there but for the grace of God, or however you want to phrase it, your roles could have been switched. So I remember you wrote one of the most heartfelt um, reviews because you basically said this was a hard read. It was, man. It was a tough yeah. read. Now let's clarify. But tough in a good way. Yeah, you said tough. Yeah. Not because of the writing was tough to get through, but tough because it really hit you. And yeah, you know. the writing is what did it too. Is the it was the back and forth of seeing like the duality of it. And I'm not the only one who's gone through it. And most of the audience knows my backstory about you know how I went into law enforcement. I was kind of going down a really crappy path. I went into the military, then I went into law enforcement. But then I also had a brother who it and that's why it was almost like, you know, Ice got out of the game and then basically spike is like almost like his best friend brother type you know and that's the way i felt about it and he goes into the system and now my brother went down the path of addiction and ending, ending up in a system eventually and then dying yeah. and i remember reading the the part about you know spike didn't spike's brother die in well, jail too he had a big family of which he's the only one left besides yeah. one kid brother doing life his oldest brother was murdered um another brother died and yeah yeah so he lost a couple brothers to addiction and to just dying in prison yeah his youngest is doing a life sentence without you know life without as they say a lot so he'll never come home it's crazy pretty man heavy. pretty heavy but, and you know uh, coming but, from this world that i do man it's like there is such a duality and you know as well as i do so many of us who have brothers and sisters out there who have gone down different paths Well, yeah, and I think I hate to say this about law enforcement. You're you're a Fed, but a lot of the local cops, they don't realize how close to the criminal personnel. FBI, I think the FBI did a whole profiling thing about that once. That the the type of guys that are drawn towards local law enforcement are offer very similar personalities to guys. Meaning they like authority, they like they like wielding their power. Of course, cops tend to use it for good, and the the other guys are on the dark side. But it's yeah, there's a lot. Like if I hadn't been born middle class two-parent home parents had enough money to send me to university in the states i don't know i was a little truant you know i got kicked out of high school i did a lot but it was when i look back it looks so juvenile but what if i had been living in south central and what if i hadn't had opportunities i might have been doing stuff that was a lot more dangerous and got me a prison record by the time i was a, a 16 year old or something you know so there but for the grace of god i mean if you were but if you're spiritual or the the path not not taken well this yeah but this this yeah this is a universal story that ice wanted to just so people who haven't read the book spike comes out of prison wants to tell his story and Ice says no fucking way man like he actually says no he's like spike every guy that comes out of prison thinks he's got a great story which spike does and then ice strategized long and hard and he said the only thing that makes you special spike is me you got a famous friend i mean you got a friend that made it made it out of that life and we can sort of show how close, you know, Ice will tell you this. He's kind of beloved, whatever. He can't really say I'm loved, but like he's on the Cheerios boxes. He's doing all this. But at 24 to 27 years old, he would have been the kind of guy that society would have said, lock him up, throw away the key. Because he said it wasn't one felony a day. It was seven, eight. It was perpetual crime because they were players. They were robbing, stealing, always tried to avoid violence when possible. Ice had a pretty good rule which is if you take down a jewelry store, 200,000, 300,000, the merchandise is insured. You take a life, the law is never gonna stop looking for you. And that's what that's the mistake that Spike made is in one of his heists, a very innocent law-abiding man was killed and Spike had to 
he almost faced the death. I mean, he was facing the death penalty in California, and he he got thirty five to life, and to his great credit, turned his life around. You know, he found in a way he he, he has a wonderful way of saying. He said, "I had to be my mother's son again." My mother was a god for me. My mother did not raise me to be this menace to society, however you want to put it. This guy that was just all about taking, taking, taking. And there's a beautiful word that Ice uses at the end of the book that I hope when people read it, I don't want to give away too much if they haven't. But Spike comes home and Ice isn't really sure is Spike really reformed. You know, he's testing it. Remember that breakfast? And mm -hmm. so people know when Ice started out, he had a crew of about 40 guys on stage, the Rhyme Syndicate. Within the Rhyme Syndicate, there was Spike and Shawnee Sean, and they were called the Old Crime Crew. And they had special satin jackets. So they'd all go on tour. And Spike comes out after all these years, and it's, it's not 40 guys. It's down to three. And they're all guys that Ice has known since at least high school. Uh, Al P, Shawnee Sean. Spike's one of them. He didn't go to high school with Ice, but he met him when he was 18. And and Ice wants to know, all right, you're home, but I don't know if I got a place for you because I'm not breaking the law anymore, man. And he says that I, I committed so many crimes and got away with it so long, I won't even spit on the sidewalk in New York because I feel like I would be issued instant karma. <laughs> and he said, he asked where Spike's head was at. Like, you know, do you think you're done? He said, are you done? And Ice has a funny line. He goes, I asked my friends who are about to get married. Are you done? Which means, are you done playing around with other women? Are you done? Are you really done? Are you ready to commit to this? And Spike said, I can't be doing that selfish shit anymore. And Ice says to me, Doug, that was the key word I needed here, selfish. Because criminality is this ultimate selfish zone. You want everything. You want it now. You feel entitled to it. You don't want to work for it. And that's a really interesting point that a lot of people don't realize. It's it's not just young people, but some, some adult men who aren't reformed criminals. Yeah, I'm entitled to that. Let me take it. I'm entitled to that. And it's extremely selfish. So Spike has put that he's, he's an orderly wheeling gurneys at a hospital for very low wage in California. He's too proud to ice. Ice will not, he can't believe it. He says like, I could give him money to get a better apartment. No, Spike wants to work his way back to and he's got to pay pay his debt. He paid his debt to society, but he really can't ever pay his debt to the the life he took. You can't make that up except by living a good life. So that's sort of the moral of this book. And I love that aspect of it. And that's why I want people to read it. There was another aspect that I wanted people to read. I specifically wanted law enforcement to read this book because, like I said, like you said, I'm a Fed, but I've worked with a ton of state and locals. When you're getting into this game, this law enforcement game, you may not have an understanding, especially if you come from like, you know, that nice middle class family and you get into law enforcement and you're not used to the streets. You need to understand cultural geography. You need to understand the people you're going to be working with. You're going to be working with the public. And a lot of times the public lives in these these dire straits and these places where people feel they deserve more than what they have and they're going to take it and you have to understand who you're dealing with and you have to understand the mind the mind i yeah. think you could deconflict all day long or you don't have to elevate it up to being use of force you can deconflict if you understand other people and it's also you know ice and spike grew up you know right before this is before rodney king and the la riots and you know it really was I think Daryl Gates referred to, you know, going into South Central and Watts as like gorillas in the mist. Like they really looked at it like we're patrolling these, you know, I hate to say these animals. And then they had these gang sweeps. So these guys grew up where if you were three black men walking down, the, three young black men walking down the street to the corner store, you could get picked up, handcuffed, taken down for, fin maybe not, sorry, maybe not handcuffed, but fingerprinted. So you, you limited it to two. So ICE would say, people would always ask me, if you did nothing wrong, why are you running from the cops? Well, they were running because nobody wants to be in the system with fingerprints. So you got to understand the way that the adversarial, it's a two-way street. I mean, the cops have a reason sometimes to look at these guys as um, up to no good. But there's also a reason that the young African-American or young Latino man would fear any contact with the cop, any, just based on what they've heard and what they've. So I think, yeah, I think it's a pretty good insight into how cops should view these people. There's also a great line that I says, in, in lieu of the cop killer, but people don't remember that's what, mm -hmm. 
How, 20 years? How, how many years is it? Decades. Probably 30 now, man. <laughs> 30, right? 30 years ago, it was on the cover of Rolling Stone. You know, cop killer. It was a point of view record before Rodney King. And he's not saying fuck the police. He's saying fuck police brutality. And when he says, he says a great line in the book. Now I stitched it all together. So I used these great sentences. He said a real, when I was a criminal, I never hated the cops. A real criminal doesn't hate the cops. You look at the cops as your adversary. It's a, it's like, I'm breaking the law. I know I'm breaking the law. It's your job to catch me. Now you catch me. I cuff up. If you can prove it, I go to prison. I don't hate you for doing your job. You know, and I think that was kind of shown with the movie Heat where Robert mm -hmm. De Niro and it's like, and yeah, so you kind of get it with bank robbers, but it's true for these street guys, you know, guys who are a little, you know, a little more on the, the hip hop side there. If they're really, they know they're selling drugs. They know they're breaking the law. They know it's the jobs of the cops to, to lock them up. And now it's a game. Am I smarter than you? Can I outwit you? Do I have techniques to counter surveil you with pigeons and <laughs> all sorts of other stuff? You know? Yeah, the criminal, the criminal world and being in law enforcement, to me, the best part about it, especially being in the investigative world, is putting the pieces of it together and, and hunting them. But but you have to put the pieces together. And that's the thing, man. It's like, I guess it's the same way if, if you look at it from the criminal aspect of it. It's like, as in the movie Heat, the heat is around a corner, man. And how are you going to stay away from them? And I'm not going to pitch another book right now, but I am. I'm listening to Heat 2 right now. And it's like incredible. Incredible, man. I haven't, I mean, I haven't checked it out. That first movie, though, was such a, oh, yeah. you, know, you get to see De Niro and Pacino and people don't, mm -hmm. they only have one scene together, right? But I mean, it's based on some real, I mean, some of those bank robberies, you know, guys are willing to risk it all. Ice told me something, I'm not sure to repeat this, but like he always says, Doug, you know, you raise the risk, you raise the profit. So he gave me a mm -hmm. hypothetical. He said, Doug, I could put together, like back when we were doing it, we tried to take down, you know, if, if each of us got 15, 20,000 from a $100,000 score, he said, look, at my age now, 62, I think he said, I could, let's say I could put together a crew of my boys. They're all, they're men now. They've got families. We could do a job. Guess what? They're going to want minimum 1 million to 2 million each for this amount of risk. That means we're going to have to go take it down a score of 10. He said, Doug, $10 million. There's a good chance someone's going to get shot and killed. Yep. And he said, it's just not worth that risk. The risk of, you know, smash and grab in a jewelry store is not that great but so that's it you start criminals really do that cost benefit analysis a smart criminal now there are guys who are just impulsive you know antisocial guys who don't think about anything i knew a guy in brooklyn one time he had just come home this guy was he used to beat up mike tyson i mean he was of that older generation from same part of brooklyn yeah i said his name his name is duffy guy was i lifted weights with him one time and he was at prison that prison workout so uh I, one of my other friends got locked up by the 71st precinct in Brooklyn. I said, what the hell were they doing? We went in to buy some, like, you know, some malt liquor, whatever. Duffy grabbed the cash register, which was bolted into the, ripped it out, uh, was, and was caught red-handed by the cops running down the street with a cash register. I've heard it. And it's like, you know, it's almost superhuman strength. You say, is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. But it's like, dude. Was there any planning involved in this? Like, how are you going to get away with a low cash register? There are now, one thing. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was thinking about like you know, you're a writer, and you've you've really brought some really great stories from all sports of spectrum out there into print. Now, you've written for with ice before, but now you're bringing this Spike and Ham together. How did you get them to open up, and how did you get this story? Like, did you help? Were you in the planning process with this? How how the whole writing process would you go? Uh, the short version of this. So, uh, yeah, Ice and I wrote his auto his his mem first memoir, which is called Ice, a memoir of gangster life, uh, from South Central to and redemption from South Central to Hollywood, and we had a good time together. And he's the easiest look of all the celebrity kind of people you could run into. Ice has zero bullshit. He has not, you know, he's a real dude. Like. You know, when he was recording the audio book, I remember him going, I'm listening in on Zoom and he's recording his part. And, and after like chapter four, he goes, hey, yo, could a motherfucker get some something to eat up in this dump? And like, oh, I said, and we got food trucks outside. And I'm thinking, oh, well, he could get a steak sandwich. He could get no food. He goes, yeah, yeah, I'd like a couple of chili cheese dogs, you know, and a Snapple, if you, you know, fruit punch Snapple. And I'm like, chili cheese dogs, okay. 
that's what makes them happy. And, you know, like, and then I tune out about two hours later, I, and I keep hearing them going, Sp- uh, Ice, we got to redo that part again. Your stomach's rumbling. And I was like, yeah. shut, shut the fuck up, stomach. I'm like, but then I talked to George, Ice's manager, and he said, yeah, that's Ice, man. Like, if, if they're catering an event on a yacht and they tell me, does he want cavern? You know what Ice wants? He wants hot dog, man. He wants Kool-Aid. Like, he just... That's that's nice. So anyway, he comes. Yeah, he has his friend Spike comes out. Apparently, Spike wants to write a book. Uh, Ice says no. Then Ice goes into Simon and Schuster. And what publishers always want is a guy like me. I've been an author of my own books. I've also collaborated, i.e., co-authored. They want a guy who knows how to write and can deliver. And so they don't want your friend from the neighborhood who says he wants to write a book. I I, I can meet a deadline and I know how to do it. So Ice calls me and says, "Look, I got this book deal, and they you know they want you." And I'm like, okay. And I says this on the audio book. I couldn't believe he said it. He goes, you know, when Doug says, I that's not enough money. And I'm like, <laughs> <"Which I can't." laughs> and he says, oh, come on. Doug. He went back and got a little bit more. He goes, come on, Doug. You know, all right, Ice, I'll fuck with you. You know, it's you. So anyway, then the craziest part was that we were all going to go to the best way to do it is just to go hang out. You know, hanging out is the best, best way to write anything. Get to know the person. So I think I was going to be in New York, go out to Ice's place. And then Spike was going to fly in, you know, maybe two long weekends because Ice works his ass off on Law and Order. Like that, those are long days. Mm-hmm. Think it's fun to be on TV. He has to leave home at five in the morning. And I mean, he's not complaining. He's well paid. But so then COVID hits. I was literally flying into New York on March 17th, 2020, and we couldn't fly. And I'm like, I said to them, I, I have this bonus interview on the audiobook. I said, yeah, you know, pressure makes diamonds. We had to figure out a way to make this happen. Zoom. So I never got to meet Spike. And we start talking on the phone and sometimes we zoom with ice and, you know, I had to do it virtually, but we all had to do everything virtually during COVID. So the the irony is I got this very intimate. I think you feel like these two guys are talking to you, Um, but it was all done. I had so many phone calls with Spike. Imagine this guy had 26, 27 years of prison stories. Yeah. Every one of them. So I record them. Ice is great at telling a story because the thing about Ice is his time is money. Like if he's going to do a commercial, he he is all about time efficiency because what is it worth to him? And not that he doesn't do things out of love, but you know he's got a concert, so he's got he's got so many things going on, right? So many commercials and his band is touring and all that. So he'll if if I get him on the phone, I tell him something. He knows how to give me a thirty minute version of the story, beginning, middle, and end, and a punchline. Boom. That's why he's so good on TV. Everybody wants him on the Tonight Show, and he's just a great interview. And he's funny, and he he says things with like aphorisms that you just go, "Wow!" Like he, one time, his his son was busted stealing a laptop. It's in our first book. I didn't put it in the second book. And he's and he's sitting t- telling this. His son, Little Ice, says to him, "Well, Dad, you got away with it. How'd you get away with it?" And he said, "Well, first of all." You stupid motherfucker. When I was stealing, there wasn't like cameras on every palm tree in Los Angeles. Second of all, I didn't have a rich dad that could have bought me the laptop. But then he had another great line. He And, you know, because his kid was talking back and he said, I've been your age. You've never been mine. Shut the fuck up and listen. <laughs> and it's just like he just speaks in these like little philosophical things that are quotable. He co- he puts them on Twitter as daily games. <laughs> Spike has things too. Like he would say, I have to become my mother's son again. He would talk about, I felt like uh, Moses being thrown out of Egypt or, you know, it's like, but his stories tended to be a lot longer. Guys who've been to prison, you know, you know, many, or guys who sit down with a cop, the amount of war stories, not every story can make it to the book. So I had a lot of compression to do with that. You know, how many prisoner rights can you read about? How many, you know, and, and there was a lot. There was now a- in the duality of that book really hit. Because you're going like through, and I think it was a, a perfect length. You could read it. You're not going to get overwhelmed and going, oh, man, I got to read 8,000 pages. Now you could read it, but the duality as Ice is moving and, and as Spike is moving, I, I really dig that. I think if you added too many of the stories, you'd probably get overwhelmed with it, man, especially if you don't know that culture. Sometimes the present culture. And I remember, so I told you I wrote Billy Queen's Under and Alone, a lot of lot of law enforcement people. And I mean, I co- co-authored it. It's his stories. But I remember we were working on it. And, you know, you're undercover. So this is an ATF agent went undercover in the in the Mongols, which is a pretty violent gang out in L.A. and went on all kinds of runs to Vegas. All over. But then there was how many times did they rape? or nearly rape and as a law enforcement you can't you can't let that rape happen and there were multiple and then i had to kind of say but you know what the more you hear like four or five, it's just they kind of get uh you get desensitized mm-hmm. you pick one 
that's really scary. And that's your one. I mean, you can't take a three year undercover investigation and tell every, every beat of it. Because you know what? It's just I've done this with the NYPD guy was undercover in the in the garbage industry, the mafia for like three or four years. And he gave me all the DD fives, uh, which, uh, yeah, you know, and I'm going through, yeah, OK, th but this meeting, it's kind of similar to the last meeting. And so that, as you, you know, when you're dealing with real life events, the trick is, yeah, compression, suspense. Yeah, every guy that's been to prison has got a million stories. There was a great story Spike had about he's, you know, phone time is everything to guys in prison. You know that. And most long, I mean, phone time is crucial. And Spike's dad was dying of lung cancer and he had his phone slot. And at that moment, there was some prison riot or something. It was like, you know, back to the cells, you know, guns get, uh, percussion guns get fired off. And when Spike came out, he was mad about his, his, uh, his, his phone slot and he got into it with one of the tower guards. And he and he threatened him, sort of like, you got to come down from that tower at some point. And he was like, Pierce, you know, so they ended up making up. because He's like, Pierce, I know you were distraught. And I said, Spike, I get that story. You, you're basically saying you were ready to die. That's how much you it, it phone time. But I said, I don't think the reader's going to get it. And it just sounds like, you know, you threatened a cop. You threatened mm -hmm. a cop the tower. It doesn't make you more sympathetic. And unless you've been to prison and understand that these guys have to do a lot of shit to survive... I didn't feel like that belonged in the book. So, so not, some of it is also just how do you selectively tell the stories because that world of prison stuff and the gang banging that goes on within prison is so beyond what you and I have experienced or almost mm -hmm. most mortals that it almost needs translation. You know, <laughs> it's a different code. They live by a different code, right? So, you know, that's one thing I want to get into is, and uh, you know what? Um, so how did, you know, you wrote, how did you write that first book with ice? Um, Cause this obviously brought you into this world again. Yeah. Well, that one, I was introduced to him. I go to his apartment, he and Coco and Coco's like, literally, you know, she's a swimsuit model. Everybody knows what she looks like. And she's literally like vacuuming the house. People ask me, what's Coco like? And I was like, she's a, you know, his wife and she, and she's like his man, like his day to day, like she keeps his, his schedule. They're just like a cute married couple, but you know, so they, so I sit down and I goes, I want to do a book about me and Coco, this rock and roll lifestyle we have. I think cause Tommy Lee and all that was, yeah. time, right. And he's like, look, man, I mean, I'm out there, I'm a player, you know, I could have any woman I want, but I choose not to Coco's out there guys hitting on her, but we, but we make it work, man. They ended up kind of doing, I think as a reality series called uh, ice loves Coco or something, or mm -hmm. kind of like, they said, I, it's kind of funny. We want to do it like I Love Lucy. And then I'm sitting there going, uh, is there a book here? And then I start, I do Ice T's records. I do colors. But then he starts telling me about, well, you know, I was born in New Jersey. And then anyway, when I got orphaned, I said, well, hold up. Wait, you know, my mom died when I was seven. My dad died when I was 11. And then I get shipped out to LA and I'm like thrown into the cauldron of the gangs. And I was like, wait, hold on, hold on. Break this down. This is like you were orphaned, no brothers and sisters. You came from a middle class home, like not middle class, like I would say working class, but the two parent home. Both parents died at heart of heart attacks. He had no siblings. I said, if you told this story, he goes, yeah, in a lot of my rhymes, I've told it in a few of my rhymes, you know, and he'll say, uh, uh, it's hell to be an orphan at an early age. You know, pops died, uh, mom's died at seven, pops died 11. What's up with heaven? But I'm like, have you told this? And the New York Times ended up calling our book hip hop's Horatio Alger story, meaning, you know, a self-made man. But he said, no, not in a book. And I said, well, there's your book. You're this guy that made it. You're this guy that came from nothing. And, you know, another great story. People don't know he was airborne, 82nd Airborne Train. Well, he didn't, he got, he got, he got tricked by the, uh, so he gets his girlfriend pregnant at 16. Sorry, she's 16, he's 18. So he's a teen parent, doesn't know how to support her, goes down to the recruiting uh, off, you're, you're military, you're ex-military. Uh, and he says, I want to be airborne. So he went to the jump training, but then he also wanted to be stationed in Hawaii. So after he goes through jump school and all that, advanced infantry training and all the things you have to do they said well there's no airborne unit in hawaii <laughs> so he ends up mm -hmm. with the, tropic, the tropic lightning outfit i think it was driving around but another key moment in that book at this time it was the 70s the, the morale in the it was just after the vietnam war morale in the u.s army was probably very very low i mean you know america had not ever lost a war the way vietnam and then they you know nobody Nobody really wanted to go into the military. There wasn't all that patriotism that we saw after 9-11. So ICE is there just to what? Support his daughter. And he's trying to make some money. 
And oh, he did jump training because you get more, you know, you get more money yeah. per month and all that. So he's got this sergeant, and all the black guys, they liked afros back then. And he would tell them, you know, cut your hair, and, and they they just would tuck it under their helmet or cap. And he says, This guy, and he knew his name. He said, Marrow, because ISIS name is Tracy Marrow. Marrow, you're only here because because you couldn't fucking make it in civilian life. You're here, you know, you're a fucking loser. You couldn't make it. I think sergeants are trained to I don't know, it's a negative way to get something out of a guy but i said i i few i use that to this day i'll never forget that guy getting in my face screaming you can't make it in in the, in this and now he did make it as a criminal bit but look at this guy he's a success and he often says hate fuels him sometimes he'll tell me i like people see if you follow ice on twitter and instagram he sometimes just claps back at these nobodies who just say bullshit about him and he goes doug i sometimes just get up and you know i'm fueled by that kind of hate like Say some shit about I, me, man. You know what? You tell me that story, and I'm like, it, boom. When I was getting out of the Army, I had about two weeks left, and there was a Sergeant Casillo who didn't like me. Didn't like me too much, and I knew I was getting out. He goes, Specialist Piccolo, you ain't out of the Army till you out of the Army, Specialist Piccolo, and he would just bust my balls the whole time. And it was one of those things. It was like, you ain't going to make it on the outside world, and I was like, okay, I'll show you. And Same to that, I good. always think about it. I'm like, I'll show you. Yep. That's a great motivator. It, that kind of thing either breaks people if they're weak, then they go, oh, maybe he's right, or you get fueled to prove a person wrong. So, uh, but just to get back to you, Ice was, I met him a couple times, and then you know what? He just, he would call me from the set of Law and Order. I'd record him, get it back to him. You know, we just had a good relationship. He's a consummate pro. And I, my, my daughter would be, it's funny because she would hear me talking to Ice and she would always say, man, you sound like cultural appropriation. I'm like, what? When Ice calls, you're like, yo, Ice, what's good? Like You sound like Phil Dumphy. What's crack a lack? And I said, I just che I just talk like I talk. And she's like, you sound like such a cornball. But anyway, Ice and me, we just, I don't know, we became friendly. And he trusts me. His manager paid me a great compliment. And he said, you know what? Ice, Ice fucks with you, Doug, because you got a, got an interesting combination there, man. You're, you're, um, and George has managed Ice, Ice's career for 40 years since the beginning. So he says, Ice fucks with you for, I mean, trusts you and, and likes you because you're talented and you're reliable. And I said, okay, because there's a lot of people in this world who are talented, but they're just they artistic genius. I will not deliver. Or, you know, I don't have inspiration. There's a lot of reliable people, tons of bricklayers and, and, and street sweepers and all kinds of guys have jobs, very reliable, but they're maybe not talented. So to, to be good at something, which is to take people's words and, you know, these are these books that are kind of, I'd say I'm a, the ventriloquist. They're not ghost written. It's not the right word, but it's an illusion. This is not a transcript of them talking, right? It takes, yeah. a, it takes a skill to take people's words and people will tell, when I read the book, the first one, he goes, man, I, I felt like I was just talking to my, I heard myself talking to myself. You nailed it. Like how I sound. So that's just a little, but he's just a pleasant guy. And then, so when the second book came up 10 years later, he's like, I want you actually the publisher wanted me just because Again, they want to work with a guy who's who's got some track record doing books. Uh, I assume it's the same in law enforcement. You don't want to hire yeah. any person. Oh, wait, what's your background? Oh, you've never done surveillance? Sorry, I'm not going to teach you on the on, on the fly. We need we need a guy who's done this. This is a big case, right? So we need a guy who's done surveillance. We've needed we've. You're no, that's exactly how it is, man. Yeah, you don't you don't learn that on the job, right? So, now, just because someone has a title like author doesn't mean they're like the right author. And that's the same way in like my world, just because someone has a title, special agent criminal investigator doesn't mean they're the right one for that job or that right one to do that investigation. It's very true. And what I had to get, I, I said this in an interview with, uh, I think Strombo, one of the, one, he's done a bunch of interviews where he breaks into this thing. He just takes down the wall and says, I can't write no book. Like he actually said this in the audio book. He goes, I can't write a book. Like I'm not good with punctuation. <laughs> If <laughs> semicolons are not what matters, but he's like, it's he gave a great analogy. He's like, you might be a great singer, you can sing, but you can't make a record. You don't know how to be an engineer and all that. So I I hire a specialist, and Doug Century knows crime. He ends up saying, so he said, you this is a particular kind of book, and I couldn't believe he said this in an interview. But he said, like, if I use certain slang or Spike uses slang, Doug's been around the Russian mafia, the Italian mafia, the bikers, all these different things. Jamaican, I understand Jamaican patois slang. Uh, he said, we can't have some lady up here saying, oh, you you picked the lock with the nail file. What were you on the way to the manicurist? 
Like I, it's, a, it's a certain kind of, I have to understand the lingo. I have to understand the ethos of how criminals, which I've done so much of this now that I just, I do understand the criminal mind. I hate to say it. Like I was told by this Russian mobster who will talk about it at a future date. He goes, Doug, I like you. You have criminal mind. And I'm like, oh God, Jesus, I do. <laughs> it's just, I understand. They understand the code that they live by. I understand what not to do around them. And also there's a certain, I mean, cops understand it pretty well. You've got to understand the criminal mind pretty well. Uh, especially if you're a veteran like you, you've done enough cases, I'm sure, Jason, that you're like, oh, this guy, I know exactly this type of criminal versus this guy, you know. And you can also tell when people are bullshitting you, <laughs> yeah. you know, especially well, as a storyteller. Yeah, I, I sat in with some guys, some of the best detectives I ever saw doing cold cases way before cold cases. And they were they were investigating old homicides. And this guy, Rashid, just a great old detective in Newark. And I, and I, they wouldn't let, NYPD wouldn't let you do this, but, but the New York, New York PD was so loose that I could just sit in the rooms while they interrogated people. And after a while, you know, cold cases, you're re-interviewing people at, you know, they've been interviewed before and before and before. And these were like decades old murders. And I said, Rashid, how do you know, how do you know how to read these people? He goes, Doug, it's really easy to remember the truth. It's really hard to remember a lie. I thought about it. He goes, if you're telling the truth, like, what did you have for lunch yesterday? You, you remember it. If you're making up a story of something that happened 10 years ago, and then you get asked about it a year later, the details will change because you're not remembering it. You're lying. And I thought, wow, that's, I don't know if that's a psychological technique yeah. that all cops know, but it's just like, if a guy's telling the truth, yes, some details might change up. But if you're telling a lie, it's really hard to remember. How did I fucking lie? Like, which one was it? <laughs> Yep. Not for nothing, by the way. There's a famous um, Hollywood producer wrote a book, and I think it, it's something he barked to his assistant as he's on the phone. Which lie did I tell? I mean, <laughs> he couldn't remember <laughs> who he was bullshitting on which bullshit. So it's not just criminals. Hollywood is filled with this shit. No, as I'm sure, man. As is politics. Every every president, every candidate must go to his. You know, it, it, which lie was I telling the other? Uh, so anyway, yeah, you learn you learn that that. The mentality, but there's a commonality to almost all these what we now call antisocial personalities. Used to be called psychopaths, all these, but it's just hubris, narcissism, wanting it now, not having the impulse control to wait. D uh, deferred gratitude, uh, de what is it? Uh, deferred gratification is not something most criminals understand. One and now, it's very rare you'll meet a criminal who like planned a, a job for five years. You know, that's tough. No. So that's always their downfall, too. And that's something that you guys in the federal side of law enforcement have is that you could, you could like Boris, this Boris Nafield, the convicted drug trafficker, racketeer. I mean, the DEA was on him for three, four years watching all his moves. They just weren't ready to take him down. But they had the, and one thing about the feds that I really respect is by the time you go in and make the arrest, the conviction rate is like, what, 98, 99%. Yeah, it's right? crazy. Yeah. So you have to, and that's the thing long term. It's all long term, and the criminal I mean, doesn't have that same mentality. That's the thing; they don't have the long term. They want let me let me recoup this money quickly. I can't wait three years because they don't even know if they're going to be alive in three years, right? Yeah, they're look at it this way: when you talk about drugs, yeah, you, a, a Fed will have a short term. Hey, the guy has some drugs in his hand. We got him, arrest him, but then they're going to wait till that guy gets out of jail, flip him, and then move on up the uh, chain of command. I mean, well, they're I always using it, you know? I encourage anybody, if you have a chance to listen to the audiobook of Split Decision, there's an hour plus interview. And I said, Ice, you got this great line we used in the first book. You said, it's really easy. Let me get it right. It's really easy to convince the streets that you're a gangster. It's a lot harder to convince the feds that you're not. Mm -hmm. I said, break that down. And he said, well, Doug, the easiest way to convince the streets that you're a gangster is just be one. Break the law, be a criminal. But or it's easy to convince. What I'm saying is once you get out of that life, like I've been watched the feds. He said, I put it this way. Some of the feds who've been watching me for years have been fired because they can't, <laughs> they couldn't find anything. I don't know if that's a bit of hyperbole, but what he's saying. And then he goes, he learned from Michael Francesi, the difference between local cops, local cops, this is budgetary things, right? Local cops have to wait till you break the law and then they come after you. The feds will suspect you of making the law, racketeering, whatever. 
wait, have the budget to let's put in this long term surveillance, let's put in this long term, we'll get the wiretaps, we'll get all this, we'll, we'll set it up, we'll set up an undercover sting. So what he's saying is it's really tough to prove to the feds that you're no longer breaking the law because they're going to watch you and mm -hmm. you better be living right because they're going to suspect. I think this guy is still, Ice got interviewed once and he said, the feds said to him, Oh, sorry. One of his buddies, one of Al P got busted by a task force. And they said, tell Ice-T we know he lives in a den of thieves. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, fine. All my friends are criminals. It doesn't mean I'm breaking the law anymore. Yeah. So, but I always tell people, well, why would that be? I said, it's just budget. You know, the budget for the FBI, the budget for DA, but it's different. Local cops, they don't have the no, local cops. They don't have like resources. That. They hate, like, I'll talk to local cops. They always say, oh, the Phoebes came in. Well, I said, why are you so antagonistic? Well, they can they can pay the uh, informants more than we can. They can do this. They can do that. So they, I always love that territorial thing between the locals and the... Oh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that offline, brother. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what is great is local cops see themselves a lot of times as more street. Yeah. They don't actually have to go to university. But I have a lot of respect for all the all the alphabet soups. You know, I mean, ATF, DEA, I've learned enough. DEA think of themselves kind of as cowboys. Mm -hmm. you know, FBI, guys, FBI guys are kind of paper pushers and we're cowboys. ATF been more cowboy. I mean, it's kind of cool. And the U.S. has done a beautiful thing. I'm in Canada right now. The Canada has one agency, the RCMP. So they've got to go after biker gangs, mm -hmm. speed, speeding tickets on the... What the U.S. did was specialize the federal department so that, you know, it's uh, drugs, alcohol, alcohol, tobacco, and I think explosives now, right? So it's ATF. That's one. Yeah. And to get the biker gangs, drug enforcement is specialized, FBI, uh, Secret Service dealing with counterfeiting. So it, it makes it less top down. I don't know. I'm very impressed by the U.S. system of at least uh, empowering various agencies to have specialties. Because it makes yeah, it it's, more lean. Now, it's definitely this, interesting down here, man. Believe me. Uh, you well, being in the in the in the trenches, but I don't know. I love it, man. Well, brother, everybody, make sure you check out Split Decisions. Doug's coming back soon. We're going to talk about the last boss of Brighton, and we got a ton of books to talk about, man. I'm look. Let, let me take a look here. I'm looking at the the Doug Century. Well, we could talk about under, uh, we could, yeah. We could do one. I've done four books with federal law enforcement who went undercover, and one and one local. So I became yeah. a kind of specialist in in talking to these guys. And if you're long term undercover, you get PTSD. It's almost impossible. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's no there's no amount of therapy or whatever. And cops don't like to go to therapy, but it's like, or they tended not to the stress of living a lie and having your life at risk for your, I'm not talking like a buy and bust for a couple of weeks, but, mm -hmm. but I mean, these guys who went deep, deep cover, they almost always come out with some kind of issue, uh, stress, paranoia, whatever. But uh, yeah, last boss of Biden, Brighton would be a cool one to do in contrast to Eisenspike because Boris is 74 years old, three federal stints, some time in the Soviet union, unrepentant, no remorse, it would do it all again, uh, would happily break the law. If you, I mean, it's like just the unrepentant antisocial personality. And it's not what I like about Ice and Spike, and I encourage you guys to read it, is that Spike, at least at the end, is a changed man. If you really think there is some hope and some redemption possible after the prison system, some rehabilitation, because we almost wonder, is it possible for anybody to be rehabilitated? This is an example of a guy who's, who is. He didn't mm -hmm. just come out of cr prison. I'm more hardened. You know, a lot of guys will go away. will tell you, you know what I learned in prison? How to be a better criminal. Yeah. A lot of guys will tell you that, right? Seriously, that's what, that's all I learned. But uh, thankfully, Spike did all the, you know, college programs and, and all the certificates and every all the self-helps and really tried to understand himself better. So at the end of the day, I wish kids were allowed to read this book, but there's so many F words. <laughs> Hey, my kids know. will read it. <laughs> no, I mean, but I wish I could get it into the middle school system. You know, it's they like, need to read it. They need to understand what the reality I, of life is, man. I, I absolutely. The problem is, I, I asked this to Ice. I said, "Do you really actually think that that fourteen to seventeen year old mentality, who's so slick, is going to listen to a sixty three year old man?" I mean, you might might understand that Ice was an OG, but the problem with that, with youth, I've got a friend in New York. He's like an old wise guy. He goes, "I don't argue with youth." And it's kind of a good point. Like, yeah. I'm not gonna, I, I gotta debate you. You're 14. 
Like, I can't explain this to you, but there's no happy ending in that life if you're in the streets. So, well, man, brother, I, I appreciate you coming on, man. I appreciate you making the time. And I mean, next time we could keep it to a different, different topic. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, multi part sounds good to me because you and I were always chopping it up anyway. Let's do it, just, man. Not just doing it on texts, you know. <laughs> Everybody, make sure you check out Split Decisions now. Head over to Doug's website. Look at all the books he's written. I was going to go through the laundry list, man, but there's too many. And also, The Last Boss of Brighton, that's my next read. I'm actually going to start it tonight because I need to read that before we do this interview because I love Split Decisions, man. <laughs> I appreciate it, Jason. Thank you so much for plugging it. And and most of all, if you go on the Amazon website, read Jason's review because, I mean, he doesn't just say what this book is. He says what this book meant to me personally and my brother and what it meant to my family and and I, I, it's very rare that a law enforcement person would actually post something like that about two two criminals <laughs> you know? it's a very unusual review and i really appreciated it and i appreciate you having me on always brother